Hi, I'm Steph and this is Alan. Great. Hey. Uh, so welcome back. We're into the third video now and we're going to cover hydration and electrolytes um, for ultra endurance performance. Um, and really no better than to have Alan here with us because he's just completed his PhD. Mm, feels like a lifetime ago already. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. 12 months ago. Now. Yeah. 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 Um, so um, I think one of the most common questions we get is really how important is hydration to our actual performance? Yeah, it's a very good question. Uh, and I think in terms of ultra endurance performance, it's, it's actually very hard to give an answer to that because yeah. when you look at most of the research, there's sort of two ways that research is typically done in um, in sports nutrition in terms of performance. One is to, to go to actual events and weigh people before and afterwards and try and get an idea of their sweat losses versus mm. how much they drank. Yep. Um, and that's not a perfect way of doing things because there are other factors that will influence body weight other than fluid out and fluid in, mm. um, you know, going to the toilet, using up glycogen, all the food that you consume, things like that. So it's yep. it's a pretty imprecise way of doing it. But um, what they do find in those studies is that there's, there is a relationship there between um, dehydration, if you call mm. it, so uh, loss of body weight and performance. Mm -hmm. But the problem is it's, it's the opposite to what you might expect. So basically the people who finish the fastest mm -hmm. end up losing the most weight yep. in an event and the people who finish the slowest um, either lose very little weight or even sometimes gain weight. Yep. And so from that you might imply, oh, actually dehydration is better for performance. Mm. Uh, but of course the two are correlated. It doesn't necessarily mean one causes the other. And we know that people that are at the pointy end of the field are running faster. They're mm. producing more body heat. They're going to sweat more. So they're going to have a higher sweat rate. Yep. So it doesn't really tell you anything about the level of, or not a lot about the level of dehydration. And also mm. the faster you go, the harder it is to, to tolerate fluid as well mm. while you're running. So yep. um, uh, I don't think that necessarily is the most useful way of looking at it. And mm. that tends to be in, in marathon events rather than ultra stuff anyway. Yep. Um, so how applicable that is to ultra is hard to tell. Yeah. The other way of looking at it is by actually going into the lab and doing studies. Yep. Um, now, one of the difficult things with this is, you know, if, if I get you in the lab on a treadmill or a bike or whatever mm -hmm. and say, you know, one trial is a dehydrated trial, one trial is a well hydrated trial, so you're going to drink different amounts of fluid. Yep. Well, you're going to know whether you're drinking mm. fluid or not. Mm. So that in itself can have an effect on mm -hmm. your performance, just knowing versus your own yeah. perception of whether it's a problem or not. Yep. So there has been a couple of studies lately where they've actually put in nasogastric tubes like you would mm. have in a hospital setting. Yep. So they can actually infuse the water into your stomach mm. and they do it behind your back so you can't see what's going on. Yep. Uh, and they do find in those studies that yes, dehydration does impair performance. However, the mm. performances they're measuring are like 15 minute all out efforts mm. at the end of a two hour ride. So yep. that's relevant to say, you know, professional road cycling or something like that, yep. but probably completely irrelevant to mm. ultra marathon running or 24 hour mountain biking or any of these kind of ultra yeah, distance, distance events. So I think the upshot of that is we don't really know for sure how much hydration or even if it does affect yep. performance. Uh, I think logically it's probably less likely the longer the event is because the lower the exercise intensity, the less the things like body temperature, um, oxygen delivery become limiting factors to performance. So mm. I think the ultra stuff, it makes sense to me that it's less likely. Mm. That said, you're out there for much longer, so yeah. it's more likely that you can become dehydrated if you're not drinking enough. Yep. But also you can become overhydrated if you get a mismatch between what you're drinking and what you're sweating as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I guess, you know, hydration to an extent then impacts other, I guess, factors that will influence performance. So, you know, we know hydration is important for um, gastrointestinal yeah. issues. Yep. Um, and that so, works both ways because, yeah, 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 you know, we know that dehydration and overhydration are risk factors for gut issues. Mm. Uh, but also if you have gut issues, then it's, you're not going to be able to drink, drink and yep. hold it down and, and get that in. So yeah. that's a risk factor for dehydration. So it kind of works in both directions. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So it's hmm, trying to strike a balance in a way. Yeah. With, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. What about if we're consuming a certain amount of carbohydrate? Hmm. So say I'm going for like 45 grams of carbs an yep. hour as yep. an example um how important then is you know getting in a certain amount of fluid for me in terms of you know performance yeah 
Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, some of that will be around, again, that gut tolerance is that the less mm. fluid you have, the higher the carbohydrate is as a concentration of that mm. fluid. Uh, and so the, uh, the greater risk of sort of gastrointestinal issues and things like that. So, yeah. I mean, a lot of people would say, you know, if they have a gel, they have to have water with it, otherwise they really struggle, struggle. to tolerate it. Yep. Um, so that's sort of the classic example I can give of that. Mm. Um, mm. In terms of is there a magical number around that, mm. you know, sports drinks are often marketed at sort of 6 to 8% six to carbs. Yep. I think that's probably not correct mm. because that completely ignores the fact that you're eating bars, exactly. chips, potatoes, yeah. gels, all sorts of things along with that that yep. will increase the carb concentration. Yeah. And then, you know, you're probably not exclusively drinking sports drink, you're probably having yeah. water as well. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so... To say, you know, everything has to be at 6 to 8%, yeah. I think, is, is garbage. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think that's just a really important point because mm -hmm. I know a lot of ultra people we work with, yep. um, they don't always consider that. So yeah. they go just for this target of, you know, however much carbohydrates, but then they they kind of go with, okay, well, I'm just going to drink according to, to thirst, but some people just don't drink very much at all. Yep. Um, and then we do get in that trouble of, okay, well, actually maybe, you know, the carbs aren't emptying from our yeah. gut um, yep. and those types of yep. things. So. so, Alan, do I need to deliberately um, hydrate during, uh, during an ultra? Yeah, I mean, definitely drinking fluid. Uh, yep. I guess the question is how much and how do you figure out how much that should be. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I think historically there's been a bit of controversy in this area, particularly in the ultra scene, about drinking to a plan, like having a number, you know, 800 mils an hour or whatever it is, versus drinking to thirst. thirst. And a lot of the people who have been, I guess, more prominent in the ultra scene have been arguing drinking to thirst is a safer strategy so you don't end up overhydrated. Um, look, I think... From my perspective, there's probably a bits of both that are useful to mm. use. Um, I think if you just rock up to a race with no thought or planning and just go drink to thirst, drink to thirst, yep. there's a good chance you're going to run into trouble. Yeah. Uh, we do know that some people who drink to thirst get significantly dehydrated. There are examples of people who drink to thirst and still ended up overhydrated with hyponatremia. Mm. So thirst mm. alone is not going to be the perfect, perfect strategy mm. for a lot of people. For mm. some people, it's absolutely fine. Mm -hmm. um, the second thing is that we know that conditions in an ultra are going to vary enormously. So, you know, the start of the race could be 5 or 10 degrees Celsius, yep. and then the middle of the day could be 35 degrees Celsius. Mm -hmm. And so your sweat rate, obviously, is going to vary over that whole duration. Yeah. And so having a number and saying, my number is 700 mils an hour, is fraught with danger because you're probably going to be drinking way too much at the start and mm. possibly not even enough yeah. later on when it gets hot. So uh, having an idea of what your sweat rate is in both the cooler weather and the hotter weather, I think at race pace is mm -hmm. handy. Um, so to do that, you do a fluid balance assessment where you weigh yourself before and after and look at the body weight loss um, to, to try and work out sweat rate. And then have that in mind in terms of planning. So say I'm going to plan to have access to this amount of fluid but I don't necessarily have to drink it yeah but there's not going to be anything worse than saying drink to thirst drink to thirst I get halfway between checkpoints and I don't have any water now mm. I'm thirsty now yeah. what do I do yeah so mm -hmm. you drink to thirst on its own is not really a strategy mm -hmm. uh, it's it's part of what can be used in a strategy mm -hmm. but I don't think it on its own it's a good strategy yeah so having that plan of how much fluid you think you might need yeah then having making sure you've got access to that amount of fluid should you need it yeah um, but then using thirst as a feedback mechanism to give you some indication of whether you're drinking enough or not enough mm. um, is, is a good strategy as well. Yep. But certainly there's no need to you know, force feed yourself fluid cool. if you're clearly yeah. not thirsty. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. What about um, if I then am doing that where I am just drinking to a, to a plan, so I'm like 800 mils an hour every yeah. hour? Yeah. What happens if I then drink too much? Like, yeah. is there any harm in me doing that? Yeah, uh, I mean, partly it'll depend on the amount of sodium that you've consumed with it. But generally speaking, if you're going to end up overhydrated, what's going to happen is you dilute your blood sodium. Mm -hmm. So you end up with a um, condition called hyponatremia, so low blood sodium. Uh, hyponatremia in itself is not the dangerous part. Um, it's the implications of that that are dangerous. So if you dilute the, the blood in your sodium, what tends to happen is that that excess water there wants to move away from that area where the sodium's low, so mm. it moves into the body's cells yep. to try and even things out. Um, 
And so what happens is the cells start to swell up and become overhydrated. And if that happens in your lungs, you get shortness of breath, what we call pulmonary edema, so mm -hmm. fluid in the lungs. Uh, but the really dangerous one is when it get, happens in your brain. So yeah. the cells in your brain start to swell up. Swell. You can get headaches, you can get confusion, you can get um, sometimes loss of consciousness, and there is about 10 or 15 documented deaths because of hypertremia. Mm -hmm. uh, the majority of these, however, would be in people who have had a plan, mm -hmm. a rigid plan, and stuck to it no matter what, and mm -hmm. it was excessive fluid. Mm -hmm. So they were drinking way too much to a prescribed plan and didn't alter that based on sort of feedback mechanisms. Yeah. And also their kidneys weren't flushing out that excess water. Excess water. So most of the time, if you're drinking too much during exercise, you'll just pee it out. Um, mm. But there's certain circumstances where that doesn't happen as it should, mm. and that's when you could develop hyponatremia. Yeah, yeah. Um, so how do I know if I'm actually getting in enough, like if I'm drinking enough during the race? Yeah, it's, it's a tricky one. Probably thirst is really the only thing that's going to give us a a guide of that and as I said before it's not perfect by any means but mm. you know you're not going to go out there and weigh yourself every hour yeah. while you're yeah. running a race yeah. um, mm. there's not much else you mm. know things like people go oh I've got headaches I'm dehydrated mm. well you can get headaches if you're overhydrated mm. yeah um, yep. you can get headaches for dozens Various of reasons, reasons. that got nothing to do with hydration yeah. so there's a whole bunch of kind of like vague symptoms that people talk about mm -hmm. in terms of dehydration personally I don't think any of them are very useful mm. um, to be honest, thirst is going to be the best one by best far. Um, yep. It's not perfect, but it's what we've got. Yeah, yeah. What about electrolytes? Because I know we all get really excited about thinking we need to take, you know, a crap load of, of salt tablets. Yep. Um, do, do we need to? And how do we know actually, like, how much sodium or salt I need to be getting in? Yeah. The do we need to is uh, in some ways a tricky question to answer because there's not as much research in sodium or you know, sodium replacement as mm. you might think. Mm. Uh, we did a review as part of my PhD of all the studies on sodium replacement and performance. We only found five. Mm. None of them were in hot weather. Yeah. Uh, and most of them had issue, like problems with the way the study was so done that you, know, you don't really trust the results. Mm. Um, that said, of those five, only one of them showed a benefit, mm -hmm. and that was in a half Ironman, so that's for about five hours of, of effort. So yep. um, the rest haven't, and not one of them has replaced sodium based on the people's losses. They've just given everyone an arbitrary amount of sodium. So in yeah, some people, okay. it was probably too much. Yep. Some people, not enough. No. And yep. Some people, about right. So mm. hard to say from a performance point of view, but if we think theoretically of what's happening in the body and what might be going on there, we can look at sodium in terms of what it does. So it's going to mainly sit within the what we call the extracellular fluid, so the fluid that's outside of our cells, mm -hmm. uh, and it's going to retain water. Mm -hmm. So if we do consume sodium in what we're drinking, we're likely to firstly be more thirsty and drink more. Yep. Uh, we're likely to retain more of that fluid in the blood rather than in the cells, uh, but we're likely to retain more water overall. Yep. We're going to pee less out. <laughs> Uh, and we're going to retain more total body water. Mm -hmm. So what you tend to see in that scenario is two things. One, your core temperature tends to be a little bit lower. It's mm -hmm. only about half a degree. Mm -hmm. um, and that's because you've got more water in your body. It just takes more effort to heat that water up. It's mm -hmm. like a, uh, a very full kettle takes longer to boil than one that's only got a cup of water in mm -hmm. it kind of thing. Uh, and the second is that our heart rate tends to be a bit lower if we've got more fluid yeah, uh, and particularly in the in the blood, yep. um, so people argue, oh, lower heart rate equals better. Well, mm. does it actually translate into performance? Mm. Questionable, mm. and particularly for the ultra, ultra stuff, stuff where the intensity is lower, mm. I'd say it's probably not relevant. Like if your heart rate's five beats higher, well, it's you know, eighty percent of its max rather than seventy five percent of its max mm -hmm. is probably not going to be of any mm. significance. Mm -hmm. um, that said, do those things add up over 10 or 15 hours? No one really knows. No one's really done that study. Well, in fact, it's almost impossible to do that, do that. study properly in the lab. Yeah. Um, but what I would say is that you know, if you don't have sodium, you're, um, it limits the amount of fluid you can drink mm. without developing hypotetremia. Mm -hmm. So um, the more sodium you have, the more fluid you can get away with drinking. Yep. And so you can keep that body water higher. Mm -hmm. And particularly over 8, 10, 12, 15 hours of exercise, that discrepancy gets bigger and bigger by yep. the hour. So at some stage, I think that is going to make a, uh, a difference. Yep. 
It's just that we haven't had the studies yet to look at that properly. Mm, yeah, yep. So sweat testing then? Yep, to look at sodium losses. Yeah. Yeah, yeah so I mean, some people will be familiar with sweat testing. Some mm. may have had it done already. So this is basically uh, where you try and take a sample of your sweat and measure the amount of sodium in it. Mm -hmm. it's usually done by sticking patches onto various body areas, usually your forearm. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, that's really the only way you're going to know what your sodium losses are. Uh -huh. um, a few things to bear in mind is that your sweat sodium varies 15% mm -hmm. day to day, regardless of what you're doing anyway. Yep. And then there's a whole bunch of other factors that will alter it even further than that. Mm -hmm. So it's only ever going to be a ballpark number. So never take you like your 50 millimoles per litre and say, that is my number. I need to look at exactly your, you know, 500 milligrams an hour loss yep. and say, I need to replace exactly 500 milligrams. It's really 500 mm -hmm. plus or minus 15%. Mm -hmm. um, then the second thing is that the tests that are done on individual patch sites almost always overestimate your whole body sodium loss. Mm -hmm. So if the lab that's doing it is not correcting it to estimate whole body, um, you need to find someone who can make that correction for mm -hmm. you, otherwise you're going to end up uh, yeah. overestimating your sodium losses. And then in terms of what you do with that result, traditionally people have sort of looked at the milligram per hour sodium mm -hmm. loss and said, well, you know, I lose 500 milligrams, therefore I need to replace mm -hmm. 500 milligrams. Mm -hmm. um, we're doing a study at the moment which actually suggests that that's probably not the right way to do it mm -hmm. uh, because generally speaking, you're not going to drink 100% of your fluid loss. Mm -hmm. So if you replace 100% of your sodium but only 60% of the water loss, mm -hmm. you've then got a mismatch there. Yep. And it's actually you're over replacing the sodium relative to the water. So yep. uh, personally, I think the better approach is to not think about milligrams per hour of sodium loss, but think about milligrams per liter of fluid consumed. Yep. Um, and then, yeah, you know, if you drink more, you end up having more sodium. If you drink less, you end up having less sodium. But the two stay in balance with each other, mm -hmm. and that makes far more sense. Um, and what about sodium um, and its involvement in muscle cramping yeah so i know we get excited about thinking that yes. sodium will stop our cramps yep yep uh yeah cramping's a, a really hard one to study mm. um it's unpredictable you can't just go right steph come into the lab and when i count to three cramp for me mm -hmm. and i can measure stuff <laughs> doesn't work that way um but what we can look at is risk factors for cramping um we know that muscle fatigue is probably the number one risk factor for cramping. Mm -hmm. um, so if you don't have muscle fatigue, you don't get exercise cramps more often than not. Mm -hmm. There are other types of cramps, obviously, like resting, like when people are in bed and stuff, yeah. but that's unrelated. Yep. Um, so you have to have that muscle fatigue. But where sodium may play a role is then further increasing or reducing that risk. Mm -hmm. uh, so traditionally, people have thought dehydration causes cramping or a mm. large sodium loss causes cramping. Mm. Uh, but actually, if you go back to the research in the 20s and 30s in miners mm -hmm. and some very recent stuff that was done in 2019, both suggest actually it's, it's the discrepancy between water and sodium that's the issue, not the loss of one or both. Yep. So if you suddenly scull a whole lot of water, um, similar to what we were talking about before with hyponatremia, it's going to force that water into your cells. Yeah. Um, and that's probably what increases the risk of cramping. cramping. So sodium might be protective just in terms of stopping that movement of water. Mm. So if you do drink a lot of water without sodium, that might increase your risk compared to if there was sodium in it. Yep. But it's not the sodium loss per se that's causing, causing the, cramping. the cramping. It's the mis mismatch between the two. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Um, could it have a role in any other form? Uh, in terms of any other like health conditions or problems? Uh, or? No, so like in terms of there's other products like pickle juice and those oh, products? Oh, I see, yeah, yeah. So things like pickle juice are designed to activate nerves within your mouth. Mm. Um, with sodium, we really don't know. Mm -hmm. I mean, pickle juice okay. is obviously very salty. Yep. So people have said, well, is it the sodium or is it the vinegar mm. or is it something else? Mm -hmm. um, as far as I'm aware, no one studied that specifically just with salt water, water. to look at yeah. what effect, if any, it has. Yeah, yeah. So a PhD or a project for someone. Maybe. Maybe, yeah. Um, okay, cool. So thanks, Alan, to um, help fill us in on that because I know, like, I certainly get a lot of questions from, yeah. from athletes in this area. Um, and we know that media and companies can sometimes, you know, confuse us a little bit. 
Um, so that's really handy. Um, so we'll finish up with this video and then our next video, video four, we'll be covering um, just some, some things to consider for multi-stage racing. See you then. Hi, I'm Steph. And I'm Alan. And today we're going to be talking about nutrition for multi-stage events. So whether that be um, self-sufficient or uh, supported um, multi-stage events. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, so um, we know a lot of people are entering into these events now and there's a lot um, around the world. Um, so Alan, I know you've had a lot of experience working with athletes mm -hmm. doing these types of events. And you've had experience running them. Yes, yes, <laughs> yep. Um, for me, the magic kind of wore off after day three. <laughs> Never again. <laughs> yeah. Mm. Um, but yeah, good experience yeah. Um, and definitely, you know, appreciated how mm. important um, nutrition is. So when we're doing these multi-stage events, what are the types of things that we need to, I guess, consider in terms of nutrition? Yeah, yeah. And I, I guess, you know, the, the obvious one to start off with is the fact that you're not just eating for today, you're eating for tomorrow as well. So yeah. if you do a, a one-off ultra marathon, you know, you've got to consider the preparation for the event, what you're eating and drinking during the event, yeah. but the post-exercise recovery doesn't really matter because unless you're going out there and wanting to do quality training within the next couple of days, it really doesn't matter what you do afterwards. After. So you don't have to think too much about that. So yeah. that's probably the main thing. And also mm -hmm. thinking about what you're eating, um, not even just in that post-exercise period after the stage, but even what you're eating during the stage is potentially contributing to your nutrition for the next day as well. Yeah. So yeah. that's obviously the biggest consideration. Um, and then in terms of multi-stage events, obviously the number of stages will vary. So you get anything from, you know, two consecutive days mm -hmm. to seven typically. Mm -hmm. But you have some people, probably more the expedition type things rather than competitive events where it could be, you know, days yeah. in a row for weeks or months at a time even. Yep. Um, and that brings in a whole new set of challenges that you're not only considering this from a sports nutrition point of view, you know, how do I fuel and recover, mm. but what I'm eating for my fueling and recovery also forms my daily diet. And, you know, over three months of eating like that, I need to make sure I get enough fibre so I'm not horribly constipated. I need to get enough vitamins and minerals for general health. Mm. So you've got to consider all of those factors as well. But that's pretty rare. And I would say anyone in that scenario work, you know, running consecutive days over weeks or months at a time probably really need some professional help to put that together to make yeah. sure that their nutrition is adequate and yeah. practical for what they're doing. Yeah, yeah, mm. yeah. How do I kind of, um, I guess, go about planning out nutrition for um, the, a multi-stage event? So let's say it's more self-sufficient. Yeah, yeah. So I think... Whenever you look at any of these events, uh, even if a single stage, but definitely in the multi stages, the logistics is probably the, the first thing because you can have you know the perfect nutrition, you know, all the food products you want in the world, um, but if you don't have the cooking facilities to make it, that's not going to help you. Uh, if you're moving around from one place to the next or you're staying in the one place over the, the whole period of time, obviously that's going to make a big difference to your strategy. So I think having an idea and understanding of those logistics is the, mm. the first thing. So what's the accommodation like? What's the cooking facilities like? Mm -hmm. um, how, how long, you know, what time do you have to actually prepare food, eat it? You know, if you're going yep. for 16 hours a day, if it's, you know, a 90 k's a day kind of event, mm -hmm. then you've only got a very small window at the start and end of each day to prepare food, eat it, and then sleep for the next day. Yep. So um, you want things obviously to be very convenient, don't require a lot of preparation. Whereas yeah. if you've got something that's only, you know, a two hour stage or a three hour stage, but then you're doing that multiple days, well, you've got yeah. plenty of time sitting around for the rest of the day to cook things, prepare things and yeah. so on. Yeah, yeah, yeah definitely. Um, and like, you know, just one example of, I guess, a nutrition factor that we might do in these events would be using caffeine, you know. Mm. Um, and I think, you know, one of the important things then that we need to consider is how late on do we have that caffeine for it then not to impact on the, Absolutely. the sleep. Absolutely, yeah, for sure. Yeah, so there's a lot of things like that to consider, yeah, definitely. Yeah, So how do I then plan um, nutrition for these multi-stage events, whether it be yeah. supported or self-sufficient? Mm. What do I need to actually consider nutrition-wise? Yep, 
yeah. So obviously the you know the preparation for day one is not going to be any different to a single stage event, mm -hmm. realistically. Yep. Uh, and your fueling during should be more or less the same anyway because you're trying to optimise performance during that. So in terms of your carbohydrate, which we've talked about in the previous video, in terms of your hydration, which we've talked about previously yes. as well. Yep. So all of that's the same. It's then thinking about what happens when you finish that stage for the day. Yep. So the main things will be uh, thinking about what we tend to call the three R's of recovery, and we'll talk about there's now probably five R's mm -hmm. because of some of the research our colleagues are doing at Monash. But the three R's traditionally have been repair, refueling and rehydration. Yep. So from a repair point of view, what we're talking about is every time we exercise, we get a little bit of damage occurring to our muscles, but also our body adapts to training. That's why, why we train and why we get better as a result of training. So yep. uh, that's driven by the, the body building new proteins inside the muscle and, and other parts of the body. Uh, and to do that, it needs a source of protein. So uh, usually one of the first things that we'd advise someone to do after a multi-stage event is get a good source of protein, protein. in. Yep. Um, and in terms of uh, what that looks like food-wise, uh, it doesn't have to be fancy protein powders or anything mm -hmm. like that. Although the reality in a lot of these events is if you're out in the middle of the bush or something, that is the most convenient mm -hmm. option. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, yeah. But it can be just, you know, from a tin of tuna or mm -hmm. a steak or some eggs or whatever. Mm -hmm. yep. That just may not be always the most practical option. Yeah. Uh, generally speaking, uh, animal-based sources of protein are a little bit more effective for recovery than plant-based sources. Mm -hmm. If you're eating the same amount, it just means that you need more of the, the plant sources. Plant yep. um, and so that can be a bit tricky for, for vegetarian or vegan athletes at times, but it's mm -hmm. certainly achievable. Yeah. Um, and so in terms of how much protein, you're aiming for probably around sort of 15 to 30 grams of protein per serving and then having that sort of every four to six hours mm -hmm. in the post-exercise period. Um, and so depending on, you know, how long the stage is, what time of the day you finish, that might be two serves for the rest of the day. It might be three serves. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it just depends on the, the event and itself and yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. When, when you get into bed and that kind of thing yep. um, but certainly for some of those multi-stage events you might you know want to have that extra serve of protein before bed mm. to get that third serving in particularly if dinner's at you know five o'clock in the afternoon and then bed's at nine or ten yeah then getting that extra serve of protein might be a good idea yep. so that's the repair side of things in terms of the refueling it's the carbohydrate so we think about you know you talked about the carbohydrate loading in the second video yep you know, it's the same thing, but now you've got a much smaller Small window, window. Yeah. To, to, to achieve that. So often you won't get to that full amount of carbohydrate. Yep. You just do the best you can. Mm -hmm. And again, it's, we talked a bit about that in that video, that it's a lot of food. And so you really need to maximise the carbs for the volume of food that you're eating. Yep. Uh, and that's going to be the same in that multi-stage scenario, but even more important that, mm -hmm. you know, you've only got a window of maybe, you know, six to 12 hours to get in as much carbs as you can. Yep. So... You know, foods that are going to be relatively low in fibre, yep. um, not, you know, we do want some protein, but mm. not overboard. Mm. Um, you know, fat is going to slow down stomach emptying and make yep. this harder to achieve, make us feel more full as well. So, yeah. you know, trying to minimise those things yep. during that period is obviously going to be important as well. Yeah, um, yeah. yeah. And yeah. just considering, obviously, like some, some days you're not going to have a great appetite necessarily yep. and particularly maybe just immediately after so you might have some gastrointestinal symptoms yeah. as well that yep. that make it harder to eat yeah yeah yep. so easy carbs can be good and yep. thinking of you know the fluid way to get it in as well mm. sometimes yeah yeah yep. yep. for sure yep. uh, so the third R is rehydration um, and there's lots of different ways we can think about this, but essentially um, it's context specific. So if you need to rehydrate in a very short period of time and probably less than sort of six hours, yep. then you really need to be quite focused on how much and, and how often you're drinking and be yeah, quite proactive with it. Yep. Uh, if you've got you know, a full sort of 15 to 24 hours, particularly if your sweat loss wasn't that great and you were able to drink a fair bit during the, the previous stage, mm -hmm. then maybe it's not so much an issue and you can drink a bit more to thirst. Mm -hmm. um, but as a general rule of thumb, if you want to rehydrate quickly, you work out how much fluid you lost that was not replaced and, um, and drink about one to one and a half times whatever that value is. Yes. So yep. you need scales to weigh yourself before and after to, mm -hmm. to figure that out. Yep. Um, so it's not always that simple to do. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes you might have to estimate it from a training run if you're not able to do that in a 
race environment. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. So they're your traditional three R's, but we know now that there's probably a couple of other things that we need to consider. Uh, one is the immune response. Mm -hmm. So making sure our body, um, our body's immune system is working as well as it can, uh, because you know you do hear stories of people getting sick during multi-stage events, and obviously that you know ruins your event, whether it's you know getting gastroenteritis or it's getting you know cold and flu mm. or, or something like that. Yep. You don't want those kind of illnesses ruining your race, both performance-wise and just the enjoyment of the event as well. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, generally speaking, pretty much everything else we've talked about in terms of carbohydrate before, during, after. Um, Adequate calories, which particularly for the self-sufficient mm. stuff we'll talk about a bit more. Um, they're probably the most important things from an immune perspective. perspective. I mean, there's lots yep. of talk about magic pills and supplements and all that kind of thing, but mm -hmm. the effect seems to be minimal, if, if anything. Yep. Uh, it's just getting those basic nutrition things right and you know, having enough calories and enough carbohydrate in particular mm. seems to be really important and protein mm. from an immune system perspective, perspective. Yeah. Um, yeah and then the last last recovery point is more around the integrity of the gut so we talked about that in terms of um, maintaining the integrity of the gut during exercise but if we haven't done that then you know how is our body going to absorb all this nutrition in the post exercise mm. period if the gut is damaged mm. Mm -hmm. so um, yeah. so there's nothing extra you need to do here but just taking those considerations of what you're doing during exercise um, to make sure that your gut's healthy and intact so it can take on that protein, take on that carbohydrate post-exercise and actually absorb it and use it properly. Yeah, yeah. I think that's a really important one. Like, I think a lot of us can get caught out with um, just uh, not always appreciating that fueling during um, and, you know, like where we tend to think about, oh, well, I'll just sort of take something on board when I'm feeling fatigued or tired. Um, and then you've missed, you know, like it might be two, three or four hours, depending on what you're doing, of fueling. Mm. And then you're trying to catch it up within this short window to then run, you know, yep. the next day. So. Yeah. And the other attitude yeah. that sometimes people might have is, oh, I don't really need to worry about eating too much during the event, you know, during the stage, mm. because I've got plenty of time in the rest of the day to, to eat for tomorrow. So I don't really need to fuel too aggressively today. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but if we're not having any carbohydrate, as you said, for several hours in a row, particularly in the heat, yeah. Um, that's going to start to impact on the integrity of the, the lining of your gut. Yeah. And then what you are eating post-stage isn't being absorbed and used as properly. Well. Yeah, yeah. How do we work out um, how much energy we do need to replace, you know, day, day to day? Like, what do we do? With great difficulty, yeah, <laughs> really. Um, yeah, there's, there's not an easy way to, to do it, frankly. Um, there are formulas around to work out the energy cost of running, for example, how many calories you, you expend during running, and then there's factors you could add on for pack weight and, and things like that. Yep. Um, I don't think any of them are perfect by no. any means. Yep. Um, and then you've got to add in, you know, um, the terrain. Uh, is it sort of soft, sandy type terrain? Is it more a you know, hard surface like a road or a pack trail or something like that? And yep. that'll impact on the energy cost as well. Yep. Um, so I don't think that's necessarily an easy question to answer. I think for something that's, you know, four to seven days, if you get a bit of a mismatch calorie wise mm -hmm. between what your body's using and what you need, it's probably not gonna be the end of the world unless it's a big mismatch. Yep. And a big mismatch is usually because either someone's deliberately trying to lose weight Yeah during it yeah. or they've had some sort of illness or gut issue that stopped them from eating enough. Yep. Um, it's pretty rare otherwise that you would get such a big mismatch. It's pretty hard to deliberately overeat and gain yeah. a huge amount of weight. Yeah. Some people will find that they do gain weight during a multi-stage event, but it's probably actually fluid weight mm. because you get an expansion of your blood volume, particularly in a hot race, that's quite common. So people say, oh, you know, I came out, you know, a kilo heavier, and yep. usually that's uh, a blood volume expansion. You just retain more fluid yep. and then increase your blood volume as a result of that. So yep. that's not so much a concern. Yeah. Uh, if you're doing the really long stuff, you know, more than seven days, um, yes, you can go to labs and try and calculate this kind of stuff. And I know, you know, at Monash we offer a service like that. And we have had people come in and try and work out exactly how many calories they need, particularly more the expedition yeah. type stuff. Yep. Um, but the, I mean, the other way is to just keep track of your weight. You know, every couple of days over that time or if it's going to be a multi-week thing at the start of each week and if your weight's trending down then probably you aren't eating enough mm -hmm. um, but other than that you know a small energy mismatch for three four five days is is not going to be the end of the world yep. provided that you're getting adequate carbohydrate and protein um, yep. 
to you, maybe you're not getting enough total calories, but if you're getting enough to fuel the exercise properly and recover from it, it's not really gonna matter that much. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So pretty much what we, I guess, tend to do if we don't have the luxury of going into the lab is kind of using the formulas that we know, you know, can get as close to what we can with estimating the needs. Yep. Um, and then based on then that total energy intake, sorry, um, audience person out the back again, um, based on that total amount, then that's when we think about, okay, well, what do we need in terms of the carbs, the protein, then, you know, yeah. fats in there. And then we're strategically putting it into, you know, that, that day. I yeah. Guess. yeah, yeah. So yeah, I think there's, there's, you're right, there's kind of two ways you can build it. One is trying to work out the calories and work that way. Mm -hmm. And the other is to say, well, let's get adequate protein. Yeah. Let's get what we know is adequate carbohydrate. Yeah. And then the calories will largely take care of themselves. And we don't really need to worry about figuring out the, the number. You, you can yeah. do it either way. It doesn't really matter too yeah. much. Yeah. yeah. And I think as long as you focus on, you know, the fueling and the recovery, yeah. the calories to a large extent will, will take, take care of themselves. Care of yeah. 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 How do I, I guess, go about planning for um, a self-sufficient event in terms of, yeah? Yeah. So obviously, all the basic nutrition principles that we've just talked about are identical. I mean, physiology doesn't change because it's a self-sufficient event. It's yeah. more the logistics and the practicality of how you achieve that will obviously be quite different. Yeah. Um, and it becomes a bit of a compromise because there's only so much you can carry with you. Mm. Um, so for those not familiar with self-sufficient events, most of them have um, a requirement to carry all your food. They'll provide you with water, but anything else you've got to carry yourself, including your clothing and equipment. Uh, and usually most events have sort of a minimum calories per day. That's part of their rules. So they'll inspect all your, your food beforehand and work out how many calories are in there. And you have to have typical ones are 2,000 calories a day. Yep. Most events, that's sort of the rule they use. So you need a minimum of 2,000 calories a day for every day of the event yeah, that's yeah. still to come, essentially. Mm. Um, 2,000 calories is not much. You know, they will nowhere near meet mm. your energy requirements. Uh, it would certainly not get you anywhere near optimal in terms of getting enough carbohydrate or protein okay. in as well. Um, so that's the first thing to bear in mind is that there will be then that significant mismatch mm. between what your body needs and, and what you're giving it. Yep. Um, and then that comes to the argument of, okay, but does that matter? Am I faster to carry you know, less weight but just have suboptimal nutrition? Yep. Or am I better to take a bit of a weight penalty and have More. better nutrition, essentially? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. But I think before you even get to that stage, the first thing is to look at what you are taking and, and try and reduce down both the, the physical size uh, and also obviously the weight of what it is that you're carrying. Mm -hmm. So uh, anything that has water in it will obviously be excess weight that you could have got elsewhere because you can access water. So yeah. uh, obviously the focus is generally on dehydrated or very dry kinds yeah. of foods yeah. and then adding water to it from what you're provided. Yeah. Yep. Um, and then trying to use that to yeah reduce down the weight and the, the space. So mm -hmm. you know dehydrated meals is where they often come in, mm -hmm. uh, plus other foods that tend to be naturally quite dry uh, yep. uh, as well. Yep. Um, and that can be a challenge for for things like protein in mm -hmm. particular. I mean carbohydrate that's pretty easy. You can get anything mm. that's pretty dry to give you carbohydrate, but protein yep. that becomes a little bit more of a challenge yep. because naturally, you know, your protein foods tend to be your animal products, mm. you know, meat, fish, dairy mm. products, poultry, that kind of thing. Yep. Uh, but you, you do have options, things like salamis and beef jerkies and yeah. that kind of thing in yep. terms of meat or mixed into to dehydrated foods yep. um, will certainly be a lot more weight and space efficient compared to something like a tin of tuna. Mm. Um, mm -hmm which obviously, you know, you've got the weight of the can for a start that you've got to carry around with you, yep. and then all the, the water or the oil that oil. it's sitting in, so yeah. it's nowhere near as um, weight efficient. Yep. Uh, and then in terms of dairy products, you know, you've got powdered milk and, and protein powders and things like that, so you do have options mm -hmm. there. Mm -hmm. um, I guess the other thing to consider from a, a self-sufficient approach is what we call flavour fatigue. And I know we talked about this back in the second video on a first single stage event, yep. but that's going to become even more important in a multi-stage event. You know, the more days you go on, the more and more sick you're going to get of eating the same thing all the time, and particularly the sweet things. Yeah. It's anecdotally what we see, and particularly in hot weather, you just get sick of having, you know, gel, sports drinks, that kind of thing. And if they're sitting in a bottle in the sun in the middle of the desert, you mm -hmm. know, heated up, 
Gatorade doesn't taste particularly yeah, pleasant. Nice. So yeah, yeah, that's yeah. they're the sort of things to yeah. to have a think about, and then looking at alternatives to that. Yeah, yeah. I remember that there was a study done last year or the year before um, that looked at, you know, am I better off taking um, a lighter pack um, or, or a heavier pack um, yep. in terms of um, per performance and um, perception of effort, that all of that. So, mm. yeah, can you fill us in on, on what we found out there? Yeah, yeah. So this kind of started out, we did a case study, uh, myself and a couple of other sports dietitians a few years ago now, um, looking at five um, competitors in Marathon de Saab, and they varied from, I think, the the highest level one finished 11th down to about 200th or so. Yeah. Uh, and just looking at their experiences and anecdotal feedback from what we planned for them versus what they found in, in reality. Yeah. Um, and one of the questions we raised in that case study is this question of, okay, well, everyone needs to carry at least 2,000 calories, but are you better to carry four or 5,000 and have a bit of a weight penalty on your back mm -hmm versus are you better to get as close to the 2,000 as possible and, and save weight? Yep. Um, obviously, you know, you put more weight in your pack, it doesn't feel great. But then having suboptimal nutrition is not going to feel great either. Mm -hmm. So which is the worst of the, the two, essentially? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we did this case study uh, back in 2015 now. Uh, it was published you know, just last year. But yep. um, it was looking at this issue of you know, lighter pack, less nutrition versus mm -hmm. heavier pack, more nutrition. So we got one person who volunteered. We, we wanted to do it as a proper study, but I think one person volunteered because yeah. you'll hear in a second why. Yeah. He actually ran a self-sufficient ultramarathon simulated in the lab on a treadmill. So 50 k's a day, five days in a row on the treadmill mm -hmm. in a 30 degree heated tent. Yeah. Um, and then eating you know, dehydrated meals just as you would in an actual event. Yeah. Um, so and would that have been, sorry about like, was it five hours basically on a treadmill if it's 10 yep. k's an hour? Yep, so. I think it was, yeah, I think it was five, so five, five hours a day. So five hours on a treadmill yep. for five days, did in you a row. say? Yep. Yeah, in a row. Yep. And we struggle sometimes to get for distance that's right. for two hours or Exactly whatever. right. And, and that's why need... we only got one person to volunteer. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yep, right. and um, so obviously you go home and sleep at home. So it wasn't yeah. you know, as living yeah. as rough as it would be, you know, in the middle of the desert or something like yeah. that. But yeah. uh, it would allow us to kind of simulate the physiology of you know carrying the heavier pack yep. or carrying the lighter pack. So we yeah. adjusted the weight of the pack based on the food. Yep. And so we calculated what his requirements were in a previous visit to the lab, and then gave him either a hundred percent of his energy needs. Yep or 50%, so we literally just cut everything in half. Yep. So half the protein, half the carbs, half the food during running, etc. Mm -hmm. um, and, and you know, 100%, you don't necessarily need to go to 100%, but when you do those studies for the first time, you sort of go to two extremes. Yeah. And then if you see that there's an effect, then you can sort of work your way into the more sort of practical, real world yeah. type scenarios. Yep. Um, so anyway, we did this and then we measured a whole lot of physiological changes mm -hmm. and also psychological things with um, various psychological assessments yep. over the five days. Uh, and basically what we saw is that when he carried the, carried the heavier pack, which was almost five kilos heavier on day one, yeah. um, despite that, from day two onwards, he felt both physically and psychologically so much better, yep. even though he was carrying more weight on his back yep. because he had all of that extra nutrition. Yeah. Um, so it, I think it's a really interesting case study because uh, we still have to convince people absolutely that you're better off to carry more even though you're carrying more weight. Mm -hmm. uh, and obviously, you know, the first time you do it, the first day, sorry, you know, your pack might be four or five kilos lighter, uh, heavier. Heavier, yep. But on the second day, the difference is smaller because you've eaten some of that food. Yep. The third day, it's smaller. And by the last day, the difference is probably less than, you know, half a kilo. Yeah. Um, so... Yes, yep. people freak out about the five kilos on day one, but they don't appreciate that the difference gets smaller and smaller as time mm, goes on. Yeah, the difference gets smaller and then you're probably getting stronger than if you didn't have yeah. you know, that enough food. Yeah, um, absolutely. Uh, and certainly, I mean, you see this anecdotally from, from people talking to people who have done multi-stage ultras that are self-sufficient is if you don't carry enough food, one, you feel lousy, mm. two, you're terribly hungry, and three, psychologically, it's it's not great. Yep. And, you know, we've heard reports from people that have been so much that way, they've actually, you know, in their mind, considered trying to steal food from yeah. other competitors. It's got so bad. Yeah. So, um, yeah, it's an interesting challenge. Um, yeah. And interestingly, like the 50% in this case study, that was still 2,500 calories a day. So that's still above the minimum requirement. Yeah, um, yeah. 
and two and a half to three is probably where most anecdotally most people tend to, to plan for yep. um, in terms of calories per day. So, I mean, what this case study suggests is that probably we should be aiming for significantly more than that. Mm -hmm. Maybe not the 100% because you've got a lot of gut issues at 100% and we probably, yep. it's probably not necessary. Yep. Um, but, you know, it, it proved the point from a research perspective, perspective. Um, and then it's probably somewhere in, you know, in the middle yeah. And probably up around the three and a half, four thousand calories a day, something like that. Yeah. For most people is probably about right. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. What about any other, you know, I guess tips and tricks that you've learned along the way working with the um, huge range of athletes that you work with yeah. in these um, multi-stage events? Yeah, I mean, I think there's probably a few things. I think we need to really not underestimate that psychological element. Component. You know, we can talk about all the physiology and what's mm -hmm. going on in the body, but you know, over that period of time, psychology mm -hmm. is going to have a huge impact, impact. into things. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that comes in a couple of forms. One is you know, the flavour fatigue that you talked about in the previous video. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's bad enough in a single stage event, but that's going to only get worse and worse as time goes on in a multi-stage. Yeah. So, um, you know, when we get feedback from people who have done multi-stage events, universally they say, oh, I was kind of prepared that this would happen, but I had no idea how bad it was going to be uh, yeah. and how much I just didn't want sweet food mm -hmm. after about day three. Mm -hmm. um, so I think planning for that you know, beforehand can be really useful. Yeah. Uh, I think food variety is really important. Mm -hmm. Again, yeah. from a psychological component, you know, you mm -hmm. might be the same nutrition, but if you're varying what you're having, mm -hmm. you, know, you don't want to get to day three and look at the dinner and go, oh, not this again. Yeah. Um, if yeah. you've got that variety and the option to go, well, actually, I don't feel like whatever I'd planned for tonight, I can mm -hmm. eat tomorrow night's dinner and swap them. Yep. Um, and hopefully I'll feel a bit different about that tomorrow, yeah. or at least I'm putting off that trauma for another yeah. day, <laughs> closer to the finish line. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah, so I think the variety is really important. important. Yep. Um, the other things, particularly in the hotter races, that the feedback that you consistently mm. get is things like gels are just disgusting. Once, yep. Like if you've got them somewhere close to you where you can get them out of your pack, they're going to cop a lot of sun mm. and heat up and mm. there's nothing worse than a hot, sticky mm. gel. gel. Yeah. Um, I yeah. don't know if you've had that experience. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yep, I have, mm. yep, yep. yep. Um, and the other one that people often feed back to us about is having a really dry mouth. Yes. And then the sorts of foods that are, you know you would normally eat and be fine, be fine with, with yeah. they become a real problem. Just things like crackers saliva. and dry biscuits, those kind of things mm. become a real challenge. Mm. Uh, easy to choke on, mm -hmm. hard to chew and swallow and it's just a lot of effort. Mm. Um, so they're things that people tend yeah. to find quite difficult. Yep. Uh, yeah. What about in terms of the, the protein side of things, Steph? Any thoughts about, yeah, the protein. about that? Yeah, um, I mean I guess it's mainly just try and have the protein in as easy form as possible yeah. um, and just because sometimes you what you don't necessarily have a huge appetite or even if you just don't have you have that dry mouth as well mm. um, so that's where you know sometimes these protein powders or skim milk powder those things yeah. can be really handy yeah. Um, yeah compared to you know the cans of tuna or mm. other things that will take up more room and yeah and um, you got the weight of the can you've got to lug around exactly yeah yeah, yeah. so I think that um, and then like um, one thing I got caught out on was you know na nausea when I was doing mm. a um, uh, event at altitude a multi-stage one um, yep. so even though I'd planned trained trained for altitude um, you know, thought I'd done well with planning for my nutrition, um, uh, was tolerating it fine in training, then in the race, you know, just got copped with this really bad nausea and hadn't really appreciated, you know, bringing a bigger variety of options with me and sort of just had sort of thought, oh, this gel, these gels are great because they've got a lot of carbs in them, 50 grams of carbs. Um, but they were thick and, and really sweet. Mm. Um, and they might have been fine in training. In training. And in single stage events. Yep. But, but day in four, race, day five in. Yeah, yeah, just struggled to get it in. So just always, even though things are going well for you and your training, we can never sort of simulate the race as much as we, we would like to. Um, so just always consider, okay, well, what if? Because in... Um, events you can you can take different options with you. So yeah, I think absolutely. that's a big one. Yeah. Yep, yep. Yep. Um, food safety is obviously one to think about. I mean, yep. obviously with dehydrated food, that's not 
usually too much, too much yeah. of an issue. Uh, yep. But just think about if you're making things up, make it up, make like it up drinks. just before you eat it, exactly. that kind of thing, because you don't want to get food poisoning yeah, halfway through. Yeah, cleaning an event. the um, bladders and stuff like that as well. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, because yep. so many of us don't do that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I think. That's, yeah, and that's I think in terms good. of hydration. Um, it's going to be very hard to try and work out what your fluid requirements are for an event like this, particularly mm -hmm. if it starts sort of early in the morning where it's quite cool and then gets mm -hmm. very hot, mm -hmm. you know, later on in the day. Mm -hmm. um, so I think drinking to thirst in this scenario is probably going to be the best yeah. strategy. Yep. Um, generally speaking, you know, people go, oh, we're out in the desert. They're only giving us, you know, rationed water. Mm -hmm. But generally that water is going to be far more than most people actually need. Yeah, anyway, um, yeah. So it's tempting to go, oh, I need to conserve every last drop of water mm. and then scull the whole lot. Mm. But there's a risk that you end up with hypernatremia yeah. following that kind of a strategy. So yep. uh, just be a bit wary about that, that just because you have all this water available doesn't mean you have to drink it. Yep. Uh, and it can be used for other things. You know, obviously, some of it goes into rehydrating meals and that sort of thing as well. Yeah, yeah, mm. yeah. Yeah. Um, so they're probably the, the main things, the main I think, things. in terms of self-sufficient events. Yeah. Obviously, never do anything in these races that you haven't tried in training. Yep. Uh, if you've got a weekend where you do you know, a long, super long session on Saturday and Sunday, use that as a bit of a two-day simulation and, yeah. and try the sort of the foods both the day before and then the, the meals around it and the during running component as well, just yeah. to see if these things are things that you are going to tolerate, tolerate because it might sound mm. fine in theory and it might be fine but when you get into the situation mm. it falls apart mm. yeah yep um and what are the what are some of the things you found work well um you know nu nutrition food product wise for yep. some of these events what have you found there can be some real winners yeah like i think the dehydrated meals are kind of a must for most of these events and depending on the event and depending on personal preference people will either go for just breakfast and dinner mm -hmm. and then snack through, through the middle yeah. or some of them will actually have a lunch, lunch. in there as well yep. uh, and it might be that you don't finish the stage until two o'clock in the afternoon you have a late lunch mm -hmm. and you know two and then dinner at seven or something like mm -hmm. that so that's still fine yeah um in terms of the snack type foods, we've talked a bit about you know the protein ones already, yep. yeah, um, the powdered milks and that yeah. kind of thing. But your beef jerky, salami yeah. sticks are really popular Great. with people mm -hmm. if, as long as you you eat meat. Yep. Um, the other ones that can be really useful for snacks. This is more just in terms of calories mm. because they're not going to be particularly good carbohydrate mm. or protein sources. But yep. nuts can be really good. Yep. They'll keep really well. They're pretty space and weight efficient for the amount of calories you get. So yep. just to add additional calories because most of it's from fat yeah. in nuts. Yeah. Um, but they can be a useful one. Mm -hmm. Yeah. M Ms can be a really good one because you're going to get some fat but also some carbohydrate. Um, and it's a form of chocolate that's not going to melt. Mm. Um, so that that's can be good. a really useful one as well. Yeah. Uh, or you can go for the peanut M&Ms, yeah. obviously, too. Yeah. Yep. Um, they're probably the ones that I've found a lot of people have sort of gravitated towards and then you know, the things that we've, we've already talked about. Yeah. Any others yeah. that, that you've yeah. used with either yourself or clients that have been particularly well-received? Um, just what we were talking about before, like um, that you could use, you know, during and or post, um, is the maltodextrin uh, yeah. um, that's just that carbohydrate um, polymer that um, doesn't have a real taste to it. Mm. Um, so it's a great way to sneak in the carbs and some energy without noticing it too much. It's and, not sweet. Yeah, yeah, and then you can add your own flavour. So a lot of times people add like a stock powder to get a bit of saltiness, but then you could add a bit of ginger or if you do want a bit of sweetness, like... You can mix and match it. Um, so, so maltodextrin, if yeah. you're unfamiliar, is as Steph said, it's that mm. sort of polymer. So it's the base ingredient for most gels, gels and a lot yeah. of sports drinks yep. as well. Yep. Um, so it gives you the carbohydrate just like sugar but without the sweet Sweetness. taste. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and you can get it like um, it's really easy to get. So dirt cheap. Yeah, dirt yeah. cheap online store or shops, maltodextrin or other name polyjuul powder. Yeah. Um, sometimes for it can be at breweries. Remember? At, yeah, at home brewery shops will yeah. sell it, yeah. or sports nutrition shops online as well. Yeah. 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 So I th yeah, I think that's probably one of the most popular ones. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I think we probably wrap up from here. Um, we hope you've enjoyed our little mini series of um, nutrition um, tips, I guess, and. Um, yeah, anything to add, Alan? Um, well, I think the main thing is that, you know, particularly for the, the multi-stage events, 
yes, there are people in there to win and you know want the performance mm. aspect of it. But for a lot of people, these events are a life experience. They're doing mm. it um, because they want a challenge. Yep. Uh, they're See raising the... money for charity or they just want to... See yeah, the views. Yeah, have an, have an amazing time. Mm. So I think the nutrition perspective, yes, there's all the performance aspect of it, but the psychological aspect can't be underestimated. And you don't want you know, your months of planning, you know, thousands of dollars that it's cost you to enter the race and travel there, all that time and effort you've put into mm. it to be ruined because you didn't plan your nutrition well and you're yeah. just miserable because you don't like the food you've brought or you're too hungry or you don't tolerate it and you've got gut issues yeah. or any of those kind of things because, you know, you're doing this presumably because you want to have an amazing right. experience and you don't want your food to be the thing that takes away from that experience. Yeah, yeah. and thank you for um, reminding me. The other thing that we need to be careful about and that I see that happens is um, just appreciate that what event you are doing um, so that you actually do do some of the training um, for it and do the nutrition for it. Um, also, if you do have health conditions like you know inflammatory bowel disease, Crohn's, ulcerative colitis, celiac disease, we actually don't have a whole heap of research in that area in terms of you know endurance and exercise and what it actually the impact that it has on the gut. So we know ultra endurance um, takes a toll on on the gut, mm. um, and then for these um, individuals that have th these conditions, um, you know it's even more important um, for you to really take your nutrition seriously and don't think I'm just going to wing it um, or copy such and such because y we can do serious damage. Um, so I just really want to hone in that message that yeah. if you if you do have that. I would highly recommend you see um, a sports dietitian um, that can help support you um, and your health for those those events. Like we want you to do it, um, definitely, but we um, also want you to do it as safely as possible. Yeah, absolutely. And, and just yeah, you know, if anyone's getting a bit overwhelmed by the logistics of planning all of mm. this stuff, mm. uh, seek out help. There are people yeah. around that have a lot of experience of working with athletes mm. and possibly doing it themselves as well yeah. um, that can draw on that experience and feedback from other athletes. And I know whenever we work with athletes that do these kind of events, we're really keen to get their feedback afterwards so we can learn from that experience and add it to our sort of collective knowledge base to help the next people yeah. that are, that are going to find themselves in a similar situation. So uh, yeah, if, if you're finding it all a bit of a challenge in terms of what to eat, how to pack it, all that kind of thing, get in touch with someone that has mm -hmm. experience working with athletes in this kind of environment. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, so Alan and I are, are here to help. We provide online um, nutrition um, consults and sessions, um, but there's a wide range of um, dietitians all around um, the world. Um, so, you know, there's uh, associations like Sports Dietitians Australia, um, Sport and Exercise Nutrition Register in the UK. Yep, yep. Um, which has both nutritionists and dietitians, but either either can be useful if they've had experience in this area. Yeah. Uh, in the US, uh, I can't remember the name of the group. I think it's called SCAN, off the oh, top yeah. of my head. Yep. Um, so there's yeah, there's a there's bunch of range. sort of associate professional associations yeah. for people with expertise in in sports nutrition and sports yeah. dietetics. Yeah. Uh, so find the one that's relevant in your country, and then look for someone who has specific expertise or experience working with people in multi-stage events, mm. and particularly the the self-sufficient ones because that's quite a specialist area. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Yep. Yeah. Cool. Well, uh, we'll say see ya for now, and we've enjoyed yeah giving you guys some. Um, nutrition advice and support and we hope you've enjoyed it too. Yeah, so best of luck with your, your running adventures, whether it's you know, your first ultra or single stage or it's you know some crazy adventure out in the, the desert somewhere. Yep. Uh, hopefully this has been useful in, in terms of helping you plan for that, performing well if that's your goal or just, just making the most of it and enjoying your experience. Cool, thanks. <laughs>